pleasure to join all of you on this platform and thanks to the EBBF for providing this platform to learn, to engage, and I am hoping to gain more insights on how all of us can be a source of social good. As social beings, uh, our interactions are constantly creating new realities and the aspirations that we have are shaped by these interactions and by these forces. In these times that we live in, uh, the pandemic has taught us to focus on the collective aspirations. Our aspirations to be a source of good stem from the knowledge that we are noble beings. Uh, so, as you know, I, I work for the government of the Republic of Namibia. I'm a policy maker and I'm responsible for trade and commerce under the Ministry of Industrialization and Trade. Namibia, of course, was particularly hit. I guess everybody says that about the economy. Due to a three years of economic recession before that, compounded by a devastating drought, of course, which is a result of climate change. Uh, we live in a desert, and um, there the effects of climate change are very, very acute. So we had a, a, a drought which uh, in uh, some people, they claim that it is the worst in living memory, uh, resulted in a record contraction of our economy of about minus 8% growth of the GDP. So you can imagine that uh, these statistics uh, on the ground, in reality, create a lot of distress to, to, to the, uh, the population. And of course, as policymakers, we are constantly occupied and preoccupied of what it is that we need to do in order to bring that dignity that each and every person deserves in our country. Being part of the national uh, COVID uh, response team uh, brought to the fore uh, that every decision, every policy, every protocol, every measure would have an impact on a human being. And that human being would be a child where schools are closed, it will be informal traders where the markets are closed. Uh, it would be healthcare workers who have to go on the call of duty. It will be public servants. It will be our essential workers. That all of the decisions that we made would have an impact on a human being. And so the principle that we followed was consultation and to widely consult on all of these impacts and particularly consult with those who were impacted the most. And so the team had to rely on each other to make the best and the most informed decision, which we're hoping would have the least uh, impact and the least harm on, on everybody. So one of the, the ways that we, we consulted was to ensure that each and every member of the team would have a voice and that whatever they said was not disregarded, but that everyone's contribution was valuable because that's how we know that we will then have a collective um, uh, implementation and a collective vision that is then easily implemented and then we could all pull together uh, as, as a team. This uh, consultative pro process really led to uh, unity of purpose as well as unity of action. Coming back to my role as a, as a public servant because that's the very interesting one. I should say that I have been in the public service from a sort of a quasi public private entity and it's not been easy. Um, it has a lot of challenges, uh, particularly uh, for service delivery. There is a certain culture that is entrenched, particularly a mindset of, of hierarchy, whereby uh, the person feels that the, the buck stops with the, the decision maker above uh, that person. And of course, this, this has led to a lot of, um, it has created a, a culture whereby creativity, innovation really lacks because the average person believes that their say or their voice doesn't really matter, but it's ultimately their supervisor, it's ultimately the, 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 the director general, they're the ones who make that final decision. So this culture, of course, I believe has really entrenched the bureaucracy and is partly what is responsible for us to not be able to, to make decisions and to be agile and respond to the needs of the country. And now looking at the pandemic and at what it has brought, we are required more than ever to be agile to be a lot more flexible in the decision-making process. And then you add the challenges of cultural norms, of course, my context being Africa, and that we are still very much bound to our customs and our cultures. And then you put in gender, because 
the whole world is still struggling with, with gender equality. And then age, uh, those of us that seem to not be as gray and as old as others, uh, it's perceived that I'm not as wide or that a younger person does not carry the, the, the wisdom. But we do know that sometimes there is that mature experience that a person has and that well-trained mind that young people have. And, and that that is an ingredient that we look for in decision making and the consultative process. So, and then as a result, this system is, is very slow and very difficult to respond. And, and this is the environment that I find myself every day operating in. So of course then, what have I done you know, uh, to try to see how to you know, gain some advances in trying to bring more flexibilities to the consultative processes and the decision-making processes in my department? The, the, the notion of, of nobility, again, which is that uh, we all have high aspirations and, and all of us have our higher nature and that every day one has to give it their best. So that's one of the things that I say to say, if you're going to wait for somebody else to make that decision, you've not given it your best on that day. Another uh, um, element that I've also brought in is uh, introduced the consultative process and, and whereby we actually rotate facilitators. So every time we have to brainstorm on an issue, uh, say, for example, when we were um, during the lockdown, we, we, we banned the, the sale of alcohol. So when we are now introducing the measures and relaxing the measures, what I would then do is that issues that related to the department would then have rotational chairs that would actually be there facilitating the meeting. So this has brought and built a little bit of confidence in, in, in some of the, of the friends. And, and by the way, I just want to say that one of the things that I am very fortunate uh, to have in my uh, 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 department is that uh, the very young workforce which is a little bit more adaptable. So I do not have a lot of people who are about to, to retire who are very entrenched in their, in, in, in the, in their thinking, but I'm very fortunate that I, I have young people. And of course, we always have this youth uh, dividend in Africa, whereby we have a lot more young people, and that gives you then the ability to be able to have greater influence over the, the, the processes as, as a leader or somebody in leadership position. And then, of course, as a public servant, the notion of service is, is, has different meaning to different people. But of course, as a Baha'i, we know that work done in the spirit of service is equals to worship. And I think every time you think that when you walk through that door, when you snooze your alarm in the morning, you are going to try to worship God. I think that mindset alone does change the environment whereby I think all of us try to give it our best. And when we all give it our best, we all feel good about that. As a public servant, the, the, the culture that I'm trying to inst instate is to say, what better way than being given an opportunity to uplift the livelihoods of those less privileged than you? And, and, and so I think when, when you start thinking about serving others and how you are fortunate that you have this opportunity to do it, why not take that advantage of it? The effects of the, of, of the pandemic have brought a lot of hardships. And I think one of the things that is likely to be neglected is the mental health of, 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 of the whole of humanity. I think uh, all of us know somebody who has died from COVID. All of us know somebody who almost died from COVID and that distress that it brought to all of us and this anxiety that is now in the world. So one of the things that I, I'm fortunate to be is the, 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 the chairperson of the wellness committee. And, and my focus really this year is, is to try to see how we can bring more awareness on, on mental health and of course, May being a mental health month, I hope that we can really all of us do our best. And I think the most important thing about mental health is to destigmatize it and not make it taboo. And that if my heart cannot be well, and if my lungs cannot be well, what is wrong when the chemical balance of my brain is not well? What makes that uh, a, a, a taboo thing? So, so we, we have dedicated this year as, as, as the chair or the, facility, the coordinator of the wellness committee to focus on mental health and we know that it's, it's really hit hard this year, especially all the people who have lost their jobs in, the, in this year. And then I think ultimately uh, what I try to do is always to inspire hope, you know, that um, uh, there is always that silver lining and that the fact that you've made it every day and that you have good health and that you can breathe and that you have family and that you have a meal uh, that you can eat. I think those are small things that we, we, we take for granted, but that is what then inspires hope. And then that taps into our, our higher nature. And then I think ultimately with, with that combination, one is able to do their best because you can only be a source of social good when you, your be you yourself have given it your best.
Thank you.